thank you for leading us in worship this morning as we come together in the presence of God. Uh, joined by the family of God here in the house at Wilsden, but also with those who are online, our online worshipers, we give thanks to God daily for you. Pastor, thank you for the invitation to be here with your lovely congregation this morning. And indeed, I pray that God will bless us as we together enter into his presence as we hear from him. Our heads are bowed, our eyes closed. Our eternal God, we thank you for blessing us today. Uh, we thank you, God, because when we look back and reflect upon this past week, we have arrived at the conclusion we are only here by the grace of God. So open our hearts now as we together open your word. Speak to us, we pray, in your own way. And help that your people will hear you for not hearing me. So put your man servant behind the cross of Calvary. That you'll be seen, heard, and uplifted. We pray in Jesus' name. Now, um, I have this confession to make. Now, since most of you do not know me, allow me to say it today. That I have this habit of trying to keep things that I feel that are valuable things. And uh, Pastor Mario would agree with me that there are times when he, if we need a bolt or a screw, <laughs> we can find it somewhere because, you know, I have a tendency to keep those things. And, and that tendency does not only stop in my, in my garage, but, you know, sometimes you take this into the house. And so I would buy, you know, I shop these um, strawberry uh, jam. And they have this lovely bottle, you know, nicely designed. And so I have this tendency, brethren, to keep these bottles and to put stuff in them. So I would, you know, buy black pepper and put it in the, in the bottle. But I leave the label as strawberry jam. Now, my wife has a difficulty with that. So she, you know, she, she wouldn't have those... Not even the, want the bottle, much less to have the label, the wrong label on the bottle. And so she would take the label off or she would scratch it off and write what's in the bottle. You must put what is in it. Well, honey, it's just the two of us. The boys aren't ready to, you know, use these things yet. But she would always remind me that what is in the bottle should be placed on the outside. The label must reflect what is inside the bottle. Uh, I'm making a point here, my beloved brethren. The point I'm making is, despite how long I have black pepper in the bottle that is a jam bottle, it does not make a jam. Those of you who are into your allotment, you would know that on your allotment you have some rodents. And despite how long the rodents are on the allotment, they do not become vegetables or fruits. Are you hearing me this morning? You see, we have this tendency to ask this question, what is a Christian? Or what is a disciple? Who is a disciple? Church, I want to say that some of us believe that if we are in church long enough, we are Christians. Or if we as preachers preach well from the pulpit, we are disciples or we are Christians. Church family, I want to say to you this morning that it takes much more than that. Much more than our tied faithful type returning. Much more than the size of our offerings. Much more than our wealth put together choir to be a Christian. As a matter of fact, Jesus answers this question in the book of Mark. Uh, Mark chapter, very early in the book of Mark, Jesus answers this question in Mark chapter 8. 
You will also find a similar uh, answer in March, in Matthew 6 or Luke chapter 9. Jesus somehow is absolutely clear about the things that we are unclear about. You see, my beloved brethren, if you have your Bibles, you can, you can, you can follow me in this uh, particular quest to answer this question as what it means to be disciples. Uh, we have this, 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 this drive or the motto or the vision that we have is, uh, what is the vision, pastor? It is uh, making disciples, building community. If you check the book of Mark, you would see it is all about discipleship. Ah, uh, Jesus encountered, um, when Jesus went to Samaria and, and the two brothers, James and John, after the rejection, said to him, Master, should we call down fire? Oh, read that story. It's an amazing story. Jesus is with these disciples and, and the disciple asks, should we call fire down from heaven and consume them? Why? Because they have rejected the Savior. And Jesus says to these two brothers who have been following now for almost three years, he says, uh, guys, you don't know what spirit you are of. You see, I want to say to us this morning that being in close proximity with Jesus does not make us disciples of Jesus. You see, the word Christian is the word that we find in, Mark, in Acts chapter 11, verse 26, when the disciples are first called Christian in the city of Antioch. It was a Gentile community. So let us not become confused. A disciple is a Christian. And a Christian is a disciple. They're one and the same thing. It is somebody who is following Jesus. I mean following Jesus in what? Allow me to say, suggest to you that a disciple is somebody who follows Jesus in commitment. A disciple is someone who follows Jesus in compassion. A disciple is someone who follows Jesus in love. A disciple is somebody who follows Jesus in caring. In empathy. Church, if we are a church of disciples, or if we are into disciple making as a church, we must be the most compassionate community here in Wilsden. I hear you. Oh, when people want, when they Citizens of this community want to experience love and acceptance and compassion and they think of a place to go. They must all with one voice echo the name of Wilsden Seventh-day Adventist Church. Why? Because there is the place where they experience the Jesus who walks in compassion, the Jesus who walks in love. The Jesus who walks in forgiveness, the Jesus who walks in acceptance that is unconditional. So let's get down to Jesus' answer. In Mark chapter, what book did I say? I said the book of Mark, didn't I? And what chapter did I say? I said chapter 8. No, 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 no. You cannot sing in church. But you can speak through that mask, can't you now? <laughs> Do not become so culturally and socially conditioned that you have forgotten how to shout the name of Jesus. Oh, you might not be able to sing like Sister Tina and my dear sisters, but at least you can say the name. There is no other name by which man shall be saved but the name of Jesus. At least you can say that if you want to be like me, you've got to follow the man whom I follow, and that man is Jesus. Amen, church? Oh, it is okay. You know, I, I, I must tell you. I've discovered that it has taken, Pastor, just about a year to recondition us. We can hardly speak about Jesus anymore. But did you know we preached about this before? Oh, yes, we preached about the last days and what will happen. But somehow when it came upon us, suddenly, Sister Tina... Even as we sing soon and very soon, we shall see the king. Somehow we have forgotten that that time, that soon is right here upon us. And we're becoming more and more conditioned not to speak his name. 
But I thank God when the apostle says, the apostle tells us, but I cannot but speak of that which I have seen with my own eyes, handled with my own hands, heard with my own ears. I've got to speak the name of Jesus. But let's get to the text. The Bible says here, uh, Mark chapter 8. Come with me to the book of Mark. The Bible says, when he had called, I'm at verse 34. When he had called the people to himself. So Jesus said, come closer. Uh, he's looking at the, the multitude, the, the, the large group of people that's following him. And he says, come closer. Come to me. Come and get close so that I can begin to teach or to speak to you about something that is extremely important. He says, come. And he also called the disciples to come close. So it's not only the disciples in this group. Jesus is also talking to other followers, people who are there, perhaps out of curiosity. People who are there simply because Jesus had just done a miracle, fed the 5,000. They're there for whatever reason. But the fact of the matter is that they are present with Jesus. Now I want to stop to make a point, side out. Church family. Pastor, when we reopen the church, perhaps in a few weeks when, when, when Boris and his team says, you are now free to reopen. Uh, we pray for that every day. That you are free. All restrictions are removed. Now there are those who are going to come to church. Can I tell you not to listen to preaching? Can I tell you there are those who are going to come and show up at church simply because you fed them during this difficult time? Simply because you provided some clothes and some refuge and some shelter? They're going to come to church. They're not coming to hear singing or preaching, but they are going to show up. Uh, Jesus said, come to me. All of them didn't come to hear him. They, some of them came because they needed their sick healed. Some came because they needed uh, some bread or some water. But Jesus said, come church family. When people show up, we have got to invite them and embrace them with the love of God. They may not show up dressed in suit and tie. Or with the latest perfume. But when they show up, I pray God that they will meet Jesus. Whether here in Wilsden, in Holloway, in Wembley, in Stanbro, wherever they show up. It would be an indictment if they do not hear the words of Jesus. Come closer. Because Christianity is about getting close and personal. Even while they say two meters apart, Christianity is to ensure that you're within that, those two meters. You see, some people follow Jesus from a distance. I'm coming back to the passage. The Bible says, he says, come. His disciples, he said to them, I'm still in verse 34. He said to them, whoever desires to come after me, let him Deny himself. You see, there is something in self-denial. Jesus said, if you're going to come after me, you've got to first deny yourself. You cannot come to me selfishly. And be full of yourself. You ask, Pastor, what does that mean? You see, in order to experience the blessings of Christianity, we've got to bear the burdens of our cross. He says, deny yourself. Then he says, what, what else did he say? You can answer me now. You can read. It says, let him deny himself and take up his, take up his cross and so three things. First of all, self-denial. Secondly, pick up your cross. And thirdly, you've got to follow 
me. Did you see follow Pastor Mario? Did you see follow Pastor Moore? There are too many people who are following the church. There are too many people who are following ministers simply because they are charismatic. You know, we've got a way of socializing that you draw people to you. Brethren, it is one thing to be drawn to a person. It is a totally different thing to be drawn to the Savior. Are you hearing me? Jesus says that if you're following, you must follow after me. Oh, so we got to, we have to break these down. So, 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 so a Christianity comes with a, with, with, with success. It comes with, 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 with joys. It comes with promises, but it also comes with pain. It comes with burden. It comes with, 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 with promises that one day Jesus will come and we will see him. But we must understand that there is a cost to discipleship. You cannot get the blessings without the cost. We cannot experience the grace without the mercies. Oh, the Bible says that he called the crowd to him and he says, you must deny yourself. Somebody says, somebody wrote somewhere, that says the opposite of self-denial, pastor, is the idol of self-gratification. Let me say that again. Somebody wrote, he says that the opposite of self-denial. What did Jesus say? That you've got to deny yourself. The person says the opposite of that is to gratify self. We live in an age of self-gratification. Oh, we call it different terms, you know. We call it self-actualization, self-efficacy, self-rule. Uh, you, you know what I'm talking about? Self-confidence. Have you noticed that all of these things are the opposite to what Jesus says? Oh, don't get me wrong. You need some self-esteem, isn't it? But listen to me now. Uh, you see, the opposite of, 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 of self-denial is self-gratification. The opposite of cross-bearing is the idol of self-preservation. Now, um, Calvin's Institute in book one writes this. It says, the human heart is a perpetual factory of idols. Every one of us is from our mother's womb an expert in inventing idol. Now, what is an idol? Uh, an idol is anything or anyone that you have allowed to take the place of God in your affections and in your honor. Let me say that again. An idol is anything or anyone so we've got pop idol. Pop idol? Am I right? You respond to me, man. Let me know I'm saying the right thing, you know. So an idol is anything or anyone who we have allowed to be in the position in our hearts where God should be. In other words, only God must occupy the highest place in your affection, in your loyalty, and in your love. If there's anything else there, or anyone else there. So my wife can become my idol. You know that, right? Oh, I love that woman so much that I can't help think about her even more than I think about God. Idolatry. I love my children so much, Pastor. That I would forget God if I have to make the choice between them and my and God. Idolatry. Or my car. Not this one, the Rolls Royce that I have at home. Or my house. Or Wilson Church. Your building. So we begin to worship the artifacts. Rather than the Savior. Are you hearing me? So that's what idolatry is about. And Jesus says 
that self must die. Self must not become an idol. So we have got to ensure that we have preoccupied ourselves with bringing before God that inert desire for these things. Why? You see, brethren, desires, all of us have desires. We may call them by different names. Give me another name you call desire. A preference. Yes, I prefer. I would like. It is my, it is my, it is my, um, my dream. Yeah. It's desire. Jesus himself had desires. So, so listen, there are nothing wrong with desires. Desires is okay. But you must understand that your desires are influenced by your flesh. It is also influenced by the world around you. But it is also influenced by the devil. Oh. Come with me. Let me just, let me just um, back up a little bit. I show you what the devil, the devil is, a, is a cunning guy. The Bible says in verse, right in, in Peter, in um, Mark chapter 8, the Bible says, verse 31, just jump up a little bit. I show you the devil, cunning guy. The devil influences our desires. And hear me now. Our actions, our words, and our behavior are conditioned by our desires. I hear you. So, there are good desires, but there are bad desires. There are biological desires, like if I'm hungry or I preach and I become dehydrated, my body says, you desire water. That's a biological desire. But then there are existential desires, desires that determine what you choose to do for your employment, where you choose to live, existential desires. So desires are not all bad. But look at what the devil does with desires. The Bible says, verse 31, and he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke this word, Openly. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Who is Peter rebuking? Who is him in the text? The text is talking about whom? Jesus. Jesus says, Peter, I gotta die. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna be rejected. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna be arrested. But I'm gonna die. Peter here is thinking not only about the safety and security of Jesus, but allow me to suggest to you that Peter is thinking about his own future. Oh, come on now. When Jesus says, Peter, follow me and make you fishers of men, what did Peter do? The Bible says Peter left all, went and followed Jesus because Peter saw his future bound up in Jesus. This is the Messiah. This is the one who will come and remove the yoke of Roman bondage, set up a kingdom, and perhaps... I'm going to be prime minister. Or perhaps I'm going to be the treasurer of the, of the exchequer. Or perhaps I'm going to be minister of labor. I'm going to be somebody in Jesus' kingdom. No, Jesus says, uh-uh, Peter, I'm going to die. Peter says, you've got to be out of your mind. After all the investment that I've made in you, have you ever felt that way? Come on now, my brothers and sisters. You've invested your life in somebody. Only be, to be disappointed. Oh, no, you've never done that. Perhaps only me. And so the Bible says, Peter says, Jesus, this is not the way it's going to turn out. And the Bible says, Jesus called, Peter calls him aside and rebuke him. But this is what Jesus says. Look at what the devil does. The Bible says, he had, um, then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when he had turned around and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter saying, get thee behind me. Where did Satan come from? Was Peter demon possessed? Hmm? There's no demon possession here, brethren. It's Peter speaking. But he's speaking out of the desires of his self 
selfish passions, his selfish desires. And so Jesus points it right out. He says, Peter, you're not speaking about the things of God. Why? Because I'm telling you that God, before the foundation of the world, before God made man, he prepared me a sacrifice. Oh, well, you read that in Revelation. That from the foundation of the world, the Lamb of God was already presented. God did not provide for our salvation by accident. He was not caught by surprise. It was part of God's plan that Jesus will come and die. Jesus says, I must go. Why? Because it is necessary for me to die. Peter says, oh no. Jesus says, that's of the devil. Brethren, do not underestimate the power of the devil. Now, Pastor Mario might be able to tell you uh, how the devil does that. I'm not certain. But Jesus says, this was the devil himself speaking when Peter sought after those desires. And so we have this fleshly passion as we seek to do God's work. And sometimes, Pastor, you have got to be careful for your own self. But church, you've got to also be careful when you sit together at church board. Some of the stuff that's coming out, according to this text, might not necessarily be in the best interest of the mission of God's church. And if it's not, then it is out there. Oh, don't be afraid to say it. So let's run back to the text. It says that those desires must die. You see, we may not even recognize it, but it is the natural truth. It is the truth. The truth that some of these things, you see, we, we, we must understand, brethren, that while we were made in the image of God, sin has tarnished and damaged that in image. And therefore, we are, no, we are no longer God. Like God, as much as we may think or desire to be, sin resides in all of us. In you, whether you're in the church here or online, sin resides in us. That is why we have this tendency, this propensity to always go after that which is contrary to God. So Jesus says, you've got to place that on the cross. It is the cross of yourself. The greatest enemy of you, crazy, is not what you may perceive it to be. It is in you. The greatest enemy of this pastor standing before you is me. So I'm not looking at somebody else as I preach. I'm preaching to me. My greatest enemy is not those difficult members. Not those contrary elders. It is me. Right here resides in me. You see, I'm told by some scholars, and I move on to the next point here, that the desires I have triggers impulses and habitual responses that might occur outside of my conscious awareness. Let me repeat that. Scholars have said that the desires that I have trigger impulses in my mind an habitual response that might occur outside of my consciousness as the desire stimulus around me gains access to my consciousness, then my behavior follow pattern. So what it means. So if, pastor, I begin to smell a certain food, aroma, a desire comes up for eating. But as much as I resist that desire, it strengthens my ability to make a different decision not to eat. But as long as I succumb to the desire, every time I smell that sin, what do I want to do? I want to eat. Now, I'll, I'll tell you another secret. Several years ago, and please do not um, think that I'm the same way. I'm no longer like that. That's what I can tell you now. Several years ago, I had this weakness, and I don't mean to offend those of us who are vegans and vegetarians, 
I'm trying to begin to get to the place where I eat raw foods. Several years ago, Pastor, I had this trouble. And that is, every time I smell KFC, it was an embarrassing thing. Because after a while, that thing, your breath can't, it, it comes through your breath, all your pores, man. People smell that stuff on you. But this thing was so bad. They say open confession is good for the soul. Never happened to me again. I'm confessing it now. So bad. That the thing seems to have had control over my car. I couldn't help whenever I see a KFC. Even if I just came from one, it was so embarrassing. Sometimes I'm ashamed to go to the counter three or four times in the same KFC. There's something about that stuff. It was not satisfying. Somehow it wasn't full in you. You couldn't be filled. You can eat and eat and eat. And before you know it, Lord help you. So first thing, deny yourself. <laughs> oh, brethren, you've got to allow self to die the death that it should die. On the cross of Calvary, Paul says, I count everything. I, I have everything that I, I've, I've possessed. Everything that I've gained, I count it. But loss for the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Jesus says, if you will come after me, you've got to let go of everything that you desire. Surrender it to me. Why? Because I know you have need of those things. Secondly, secondly, you must um, take up your cross. Now, cross bearing, in the context in which Jesus was speaking, was indicative of a person who had been sentenced for execution. So when Jesus said this to these guys, they understood one thing. Jesus is talking about dying. He says, take up your cross and follow me. When you saw somebody bearing a cross, they were making a one-way journey to a place of execution. So Jesus is saying this to you. You and I. That you and I must take up all the things that are against us. Must take up all those fleshly desires and passions and worldly things that we have that is anchoring us down in this world to the extent that we can hardly see or hear Jesus. Those things we cannot sleep without thinking about. And carry them to the place of execution, the place of Golgotha. And allow me to say, thirdly, the third thing we see in the text is that we must follow. Follow Jesus. And I told you already that following Jesus, it is simple. It is easy. Why? Because Jesus says, my yoke is easy. And my burden is light. It is all in the self-denial and the bearing of the cross. Contrary to what most people may think, the cross bearing is not what some of us may think. You know, some of us, we think the, the cross is the, the boss we got that is giving us trouble. Not to you. Some of us may think the cross that we have to carry is the wife or the husband that is or the children. Oh, Father of mercy. You know how easy these things could change. When we wanted it, we prayed for it. You don't know what I'm talking about. Because you have not had the opportunity to pray yet. But when you pray 10 years for your children. And then God blesses you with them. Father of mercy. And then the difficulty comes and the challenge of raising them. Oh, and sometimes you ask yourself, what did I ask for? Oh, I had no knowledge of what I asked for. My whole life has been turned upside down. I have to go to school here and school there and PTA here. And your life is in the spiral. And then you ask yourself, Lord, did I pray for this? Oh, I use children because that is easy. 
But some of us husbands and wives know what I'm talking about. You know, if I didn't get her, I'll die. Or if I didn't get him, pastor, I will die. But then a few years down the line, darling becomes donkey. And he begins to kick up. You couldn't hear pastor when pastor told you. Pastor said, look, I'm seeing some signs. I can't tell you what to do, but I will suggest to you, run. No, you couldn't say it in that kind of language, you know. Because that's not what you wanted to hear. I love him so much. And then the pain comes. And so you believe that's your cross. Brethren, that's not your cross. Let's not cheapen the cross of Christ. So firstly is, firstly is deny self. Secondly is pick up your cross. And thirdly is that you must follow Jesus. Not the church. Because listen, when you get very close to the church, you'll, you'll discover that we are all different in church. That it takes a lot of work to, put, to do the singing that you sang this morning. You'll discover that. You'll also discover that the pastor isn't perfect. And the elders are not perfect. You'll discover that it takes a lot of work and practice to create a worship experience that you normally have and enjoy. And that in the background there's some messy stuff. And then you become disappointed or disgruntled. And the imperfection of the church will make you leave the church. But if you stick following Jesus, you will discover that despite what is happening in and around the church, that Jesus is the perfect one. So follow him and continue to follow him. But the text doesn't stop there. Allow me to make three more points, three reasons. So three demands, deny self, take up your cross, follow him. Three reasons, three demands. Let's do for three reasons now. Right here in the text, the Bible says, <clears throat> I'm looking at verse 35. For who desire to save his life will lose it. But whosoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel will find or save his life. First reason why you should engage in self-denial, cross-bearing, and following Jesus is because your life depends upon it. Jesus says, without it, you will lose your soul. In other words, you cannot make it to the kingdom of God except you follow Christ. It is not about the size of your tight return. It is not about how long you pray. Is about following Jesus at the point of his brokenness in the garden of Gethsemane. Do you see Jesus in Gethsemane? Have you followed him to Gethsemane? Do you understand when he fell upon the ground and said, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. I'm talking, Pastor, next week about real prayer on Wednesday. When you come together to pray and fast, it's real Prayer. Oh. Follow him to Calvary. Why? Because your life depends upon it. The second reason. 
Second reason, verse 36. For what will you give in? What will profit a man if he gains the world, the whole world, and loses his soul? Verse 37. For what will you give in exchange of your soul? What is there that is so valuable in this life that you will give in exchange for your soul? And Jesus is okay with that. The answer that you would give is nothing, pastor. Nothing is as valuable. Why? Because my soul is worth the life of Jesus himself. In order to purchase me back from the devil, Jesus died on Calvary. And there is nothing. In the words of the hymn writer, this word says, nothing between my soul and the Savior. Oh, Peter asks a similar question in Matthew chapter 19. If you have time, you can read that 19 verse 27 to 29. When, 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 the, when that rich man came to Jesus and he says, what can I do? Jesus says, I want, he says, oh, th this is too much, man. And he walked away. Jesus said, you see, not even rich man. It's impossible, difficult for people who are rich, people who are not in need, people who do not acknowledge what their needs are to enter into the kingdom of God. Then, then, then Peter says, well, well, it's not them. I have left all. Peter is there speaking not only for himself, but he's mostly spokesman for all of the disciples. He says, we have left all. What shall we have in return? Church family, when I talk about giving up for Jesus, Jesus says, Peter, I understand that you've left all. And this is what I love about Jesus. Jesus did not say, Peter, you got mercenaries' motives. You just follow me because you can get. Church, there are people who are going to come to the church simply because of what they can get. That's not your business. Pray that they will encounter Jesus and get him too. Are you with me? So Jesus says, Peter... I understand you have this humanity with you. You, 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 know, you. you give up all of this, but I want you to know what you will get. Uh, somebody, let's just, let me just read that. I got, got a few more minutes, isn't it, Pastor? Let me just read that. Matthew chapter 9, it's 19 if you have, you have your Bibles. Just quickly, let me just read what Jesus said to Peter. Matthew 19, I'll read from verse, verse 27. The Bible says here in Matthew 19, verse 27. And again, Peter, yes. Then Peter answered and said to him, See, we have left all and followed you. Therefore, what shall we have? So Jesus said to him, to them, Assuredly, I say to you, notice, I told you Peter is speaking for all of them. Jesus did not say, Peter, I assure you. He said, to all of you, he says, to them, Assuredly, I say to you, that in this regeneration, when the Son of Man sits on the throne of his glory, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And everyone, verse 29, everyone who have left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or land for my name's sake shall receive the hundredfold and inherit eternal life. Brethren, let me say this to you. What Jesus is offering you is much more than we will ever give up for him. And the reason these are mentioned is because these are the most valuable. The reason it says children and wife and husband and brothers and sisters, because those are the most important relationships that we have. And perhaps if you didn't recognize that, you would have recognized that during this pandemic. When you were locked in. When the government shut down everything, you couldn't even go out, couldn't drive your car. Then you realize how valuable is family. Jesus told us there, he says, if you have given that up, you will get that back and even more. Why? Because if you lose brothers and sisters, you got a family of God. So it is not pie in the sky when you die. It's something sung right here in Will's Zen Church while you're still around. So if you need family... If you find yourself all alone, 
probably locked away someplace and you're all alone and you need family, I suggest to you that you come down to Wilson Church. You're going to find some people here whom God has planted here who will love you with the love of God, unconditionally embrace you and you will begin to experience Jesus and develop a longing for him. So by the time you see the clouds of glory, and Jesus opens the skies of heaven and he begins to return. And the Bible says when he come back, oh, we are all going home together. Then you've got the family of God. Not only the earthly inheritance, but Jesus says, I'm going to double that up. A hundredfold hop down here. But I'm going to top that up. In other words, he's going to give you a tip. Eternal life. Forevermore. My brothers and sisters, so following Jesus is the best thing that I have ever done. And so I want to suggest to you, remember that Christianity is about following Jesus. It's about denying yourself. It's about taking up that cross. Ah, oh, and following him. And the reason you're doing it is because your life Depends upon it. Secondly. The second reason you're doing it. Is because there's nothing. That's more valuable than your soul. And the third reason is because he's coming again. To bless you. Our sisters will lead us. In